Good morning and welcome to Neighborhood Christian Fellowship this morning. We are so glad that you're worshiping with us here today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, help us to hear from you. Father, may your spirit break out in our living rooms. And God, may we come closer to you through your word this morning. In the name of Jesus. Sounds a new beginning. As distant hearts begin believing, redemption's bid is unrelenting. You love. right now, but NCF is still committed to ministering to our community, and you can help us to do that through giving. We have three options. The first is that you can send it to our physical address. Second, you can text the word GIVE to 84321, or you can go on our website, myncf.org, click GIVE and do it there. 
Thank you for continuing to partner with us in the ministry that God has called us to do. It's so wonderful to be here today with each and every one of you, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be able to share God's word and the good news that he has for us. As we go through the scripture today, let's remember his amazing grace for us, the opportunity that we each have to be here today, to hear his word, to reflect on his goodness, and to share this good news with everyone around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity as we gather, as we listen, as we've sung, as we pray. God, we just pray that this praise to you will be a fragrant offering. We pray that you will use this time, Lord, that you would be glorified and that we would grow through it. Father, as we discuss the wisdom of the world, as we discuss the, the folly of the cross, I pray Lord, that this will pierce our hearts. Lord, that we will be changed. That, are, that we will renew those things that we need to renew. That we will understand more and more about you. That we will desire you more and more. And that the things of this world will simply fade away. We thank you for the hope, the peace, the grace that we have in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's passage of scripture is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. It's kind of a larger portion of scripture, and actually as I've been going through and studying this, I've realized that this is something that I'm going to have to go through quite quickly, that there is a lot of meat to it, things that we could learn from it, and that would benefit us for not only just in, the, in today's society, but also in the future as we continue on, as our families grow, as things change, as life continues on. This passage today specifically discusses wisdom, and it talks about the wisdom and the understanding of the world, and the wisdom and the understanding of God. And as I begin to read these, this passage of scripture, listen to the different things, the contrast that the Apostle Paul brings in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached, to those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I want to just quickly frame up where first uh, century Christians would fit into, into the city of Corinth. Corinth was an amazing uh, city that had been built up over the last hundred years after its destruction in 147 BC. And what had occurred during this time is that the physical spacing that Corinth had was that it was an, on an isthmus. It had a sea on one side and a sea on the other, making it a port city, making it an understanding. There's an understanding there that there was a great amount of um, trade and culture that ships would come in and ships would actually, because there was not a canal to, to 
connect the two seas, that ships would come in, they would have to unload all of their cargo and then go and then reload on the other side of Corinth. But this passing through, this city of culture, this city of political, religious, and philosophical culture was just an amazing opportunity for a Christian to be not only heard, but also grow. And this is the, this is the time that the Apostle Paul came. The understanding is that the Apostle Paul came around between 50 and 51 AD and um, spent about a year and a half there with Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila had been kicked out of Rome uh, a few years early by Claudius. So the letter that the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth is probably about two years after his initial visit. And what this what the Apostle Paul sees that is occurring in this time in Corinth is that there are those within the Christian movement, the congregation there, that have begun to kind of move away from a, a simple message and what he says a foolish message, the, the message of the cross, the message of God's only son coming down and dying and raised, being raised again so that we could all know God and, and experience his goodness and his love and his mercy. That, the, that many of the people who had initially uh, come to know the Lord were maybe starting to move away because they were being dragged away or pulled away by other philosophical thoughts. And there were many that were um, there at that time. Not only were there Jews and Greeks, but then there were also uh, philosophical differences, whether it be Epicureans or Stoics or Sophists or Platonists. All of these uh, thoughts were a part of this culture and, a, and the fabric of the society there. Paul is speaking directly, when he's writing this, he's speaking directly to them, and he's beginning initially by just giving them an understanding of wisdom, showing them that although there is wisdom to be had, that they believe to be had by the individuals in this society, the reality is, is that his main message is, this, is simply this, Paul resolves to proclaim the gospel, the message of the cross. And these words of wisdom were his, his hope and his desire and that they would fall in the ears of believers, of true believers. And that those who did not understand it or did not want to believe it, that they would continue to uh, go in their way and not believe in this foolishness that he speaks of. In verse 18 we read, um, that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Paul wants them to think that the gospel is, is, isn't just a philosophical system. He doesn't want them to think that it's some supremely wise system that stands uh, above others. It is far more. He wants them to see that human wisdom utterly fails to deal with the, with the human need, that God himself has taken into action through his son, Jesus Christ. We are powerless when it comes to dealing with our sin and being reconciled to God. But where we are powerless, God is powerful. Human powerlessness and wisdom are equally unable to achieve what God has accomplished in the cross. The gospel is not simply good advice. The gospel is God's power to those who believe. The place where God has supremely destroyed all human arrogance and pretense in the cross. These are very powerful words that we, that we read here. And as we continue on in verse 19, Paul says this, and he quotes from Isaiah 29, 14, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. He's simply pointing again to the cross and he's saying, this is God's way of doing what he said he was going to do. By the cross, God sets aside and shatters all human pretense of what strength and wisdom are. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. 
Just to briefly go over the three, the three main areas that the Apostle Paul covers here, he talks about why a wise person. And this is specifically directed to this, this time of, in, in history where the philosophers of that day were trying to get a, a coherent system of life, of everything involving life from, from birth to death, an understanding of what was most important, what, what made them most impactful in their lives, how they, could, how they could better themselves and how they could better the world around them. These were all things um, that the wise person would have been looking for. The teacher of the law is the second one. That is specifically talks about a scribe or an expert in the law. This is an understanding Paul is talking to those Jews who um, are very steeped in the law and understand the law and would understand who Jesus was and what he had done and how, how they had been told uh, through their faith that, that Jesus was not the Son of God. Paul then discusses the philosopher. This would be the person of the person who literally, what it meant was they the order, the people who would speak for others, who would, who would stand in the temples and speak of the, the thoughts and the philosophies of that day. Those who were highly regarded and had incredible gifts of, of defending and discussing philosophical views. As Paul talks about each one of these, he, the, the, the fact is simple, that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. Paul does not merely mean that God made the world's wisdom appear to be foolish, but he said it in a far stronger way that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world, and he has reduced that wisdom to pure folly. In verse 22 through 24, we read, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. There's a very interesting thing that Paul brings up here, and we know this in the, in the New Testament, that the Jews often demanded a sign. So it wasn't enough that Jesus would feed 5,000 or, you know, well over that, in, or that Jesus would heal someone or uh, of blindness or bring someone back to life. It was, there was this constant demand from Jesus that they had to see another sign, another thing, another reason as to how they, why they could believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And we know in scripture that Jesus got to the point where he said, you can continue to demand signs, but this is basically not because you want to believe, but, it, but you are faithless and that you will never believe no matter what I do. So the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah which would be the understanding of what Jesus did when he died and three days rose again. So we have here, these, these signs would, would say, the people would say, I will devote myself to this God if he heals my child. I will follow him if he gives me what I want. I will turn away from sin and read the Bible if my marriage gets sorted out. All of these different things that um, we often bring to God and say, I will if... If you, and the reality is, is that we didn't, we're not here to um, come on our own terms. We don't come to Christ on, with demands as we can assess him and say, oh, well, you, if you do this for me, then I'll do this. But what it is, is we don't give God the terms. God has already given us the terms. The terms are this, that those who are sick need a doctor. And what his son Jesus Christ did on the cross when he died for us is he, saved, he gave us an opportunity to be, to be saved from our sins. That's the stipulation. The, the, the demand for signs and miracles and everything else, the Apostle Paul is saying that that's not something that um, they should be looking toward. The other thing the Apostle Paul says here, he talks about the foolishness of the Gentiles. This, again... It is foolishness to the Gentiles simply because the Gentiles, the, specific, the uh, philosophers of that day, simply would say to themselves, well, this is one thought in philosophy, but how does it help me here? How, do, how does looking at the cross and seeing the Son of God crucified and sins forgiven, how does this help me in, in this realm in my life? How does this make my life better in the future? How can it help me? And, they, and they, they never viewed it as a comprehensive thing. They viewed it as one moment in time, and they viewed it as one thing that, they could, that um, was looked at but then quickly dismissed. So in, in this understanding, the, the, for many, 
uh, Jews, the long-expected Messiah had come in splendor and glory. He had begun his reign with uncontested power. Um, if there really was a crucified Messiah, then this was completely opposite as to what they believed the Messiah would look like. Because it is declared in Deuteronomy 21, 23, that God himself had said, everyone who hangs in shame on a tree stands under God's curse. You know, the amazing thing about this passage of Scripture is this, is that Christ did come. And not only did he come, but he took our, sin, he took our sins upon him. And when he did that and he died, that sin then no longer held its grip, held its reign on our lives. When he came back to life, the understanding is that he was triumphant. He was victorious over Satan, sin, and death. What I would encourage you today is, is simply this, that if you feel that you are weak, if you feel that you're foolish when you're around people of the world, if you feel that they don't listen to you, you feel like that there's, it's, it's hopeless to be a Christian, I would say be, realize that there is a strength that you can rely on that isn't, doesn't come from human praise. There is an understanding that you can hope in and a peace that you can truly experience through the understanding of the cross and what the cross says to us. As we begin to look at the rest of the scripture, I want to read to you uh, verse 25 through 31, and these words are powerful. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ's righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let everyone who boasts, boast in the Lord. I, I love this uh, verse 25 where it basically says, the world dismisses this um, this cross is foolishness, that this would be the foolishness of God. That if, if God did anything that just didn't make sense, it would be the foundation of, of what happened with his son. But the reality is, is that this may be foolishness to the world because the world does not accept, the world does not understand Jesus Christ. They don't understand the one who, their creator, and the one who has called them to a deeper relationship with him. So in, in, in as if God could be weak, Again, when, when we look at that word and we look at that term, the understanding here is, is that um, for those who don't understand and those who don't believe, that, that, that shows an incredible weakness that someone would die on the cross, that, that there wasn't this draw to strength and power, that there wasn't this overwhelming sense of I'm going to establish a government and I'm going to um, rule from uh, on high on a throne in a physical sense. What I really see and understand in this verse is this, is when we depend on our plans and programs and vision statements, sometimes we lose, this, we lose sight of the foolishness of, of the cross in order to gain wisdom through strate strategic planning. There's nothing wrong with being strategic and planning, but the reality is, is that we always need to make sure that the first thing that we look at, the first understanding that comes from our mind and our hearts and our lips is the cross is the power of the cross. I want to close with this. William Barclay said this, Christianity made people who were considered of no value into real men and women, more into sons and daughters of God. It gave those who had no respect their self-respect in Christ. It gave those who had no life, life eternal in Christ. It told people that even if they didn't matter to others, they still mattered intensely to God. It told people who in the eyes of the world were worthless, that in the eyes of God they were worth the death of his only son. Christianity was and still is the most uplifting thing in the whole universe. And that last statement is really powerful. Christianity was and is the most uplifting thing in the whole universe. I ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ today, is that how you live your life? Do you live with the understanding that you are you are are each day waking up and, and truly submitting yourselves, humbly submitting yourselves to him, submitting yourselves to the understanding that we are to pick up our cross daily and follow him. 
The power of this message is not to refute all of the things that human beings may have. The power of this message is just simply this. The cross and the cross alone may not make sense to the world, but the cross and the cross alone is the power of God that we may have life and have it to the fullest. Let's pray. Holy Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day. I thank you for this message. I thank you for the hope that comes through this message. I pray now, Lord, that as um, we go about our day and as we go about our week and our month, Lord, that you impress upon our hearts the importance of the cross, that it is foolishness to those who do not believe, but that it is our hope, it is our strength, it is our wisdom, it is, it is our everything. And we thank you so much for the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today at NCF. 
We're so glad that we could worship together. If you're new with us, or if it's your first time, we'd love to connect with you. Go ahead and drop a smiley face emoji right there in the comments, and we'll make sure to reach out. If you'd like to get to know a bit more about our church, uh, go ahead and text the word hello to 626-587-3357. If you'd like prayer or a personal conversation with one of our pastors, you can text the word prayer to that same number. Again, thank you for joining us, and we really look forward to seeing you soon.